On March 5, 2020, the Faculty of Medical Sciences Teaching and Research Complex, the UWI Mona Campus, held a conference entitled COVID-19 Pandemic Preparedness. Speaking on virology, pathogenesis, and infection control is Dr. Sandra Jackson. My main goal today is for you to have a better understanding and appreciation of what the coronavirus is, uh, what its potential is, and what you can do to mitigate the transmission of this virus within Jamaica. So I really want you to go away with an understanding of what the virus is. I'm not going to give you a lecture on virology. Um, I don't think you'd <laughs> remember too much of the details. But as I said, it's an RNA virus. It's enveloped. And what's very important, what's, what's for us to understand, is that it has these spikes on the surface of it and they're called spike proteins, and these are very important, and we will discuss more why these spike proteins are important. We've discussed and you've heard that coronaviruses exist in a wide variety of animals, and also that there are seven, to date, seven coronaviruses, four of which cause a common cold, and three of which have mutated to cause more severe infections in humans. Of note, the coronaviruses within the animal species, there are over 400 of them. So as these viruses continue to evolve, we should expect and should entertain surveillance of coronaviruses in general so we know exactly what is on our doorstep. In this uh, phylogenetic uh, analysis here, I put this, this is actually showing you the results of um, analysis of the genome of approximately fi over 500 cases presently occurring um, in the outbreak. And I'm not sure if you can actually see the ones in, oh, we do have a, yes, in purple. In purple, these here in purple are the coronaviruses that were associated with MERS. And you can see this, the, the tree is actually showing you the deviation of the coronaviruses as they have evolved. The ones in green here are the ones that are more associated with the common cold. And these in yellow-orange color here are the ones that are associated or were associated with the SARS outbreak of 2003. And right at the bottom here is the little red dot, and this is where the COV-19 is, or SARS-2. Surrounding this, we see the, the sequences of some little gray viruses here. And these are representative of the sequences of coronaviruses that were analyzed from bats. So this is showing you the similarity of the sequence of the genome of the coronavirus from SARS, bats, and the present 2019 um, COV. So what's different with this virus compared to other viruses, compared with the SARS, COV, and MERS in terms of transmission? Why didn't SARS, COV, and MERS spread as rapidly as the present 2019 virus? When we look at the human coronaviruses, the four that have adapted themselves to circulation within the human population, these are these, the uh, coronavirus 229E, NL63, HKU1, and OC43. And they usually infect children. Children can get repeated infections. They present with sneeze stuffiness, not a very high fever. However, when we come to the coronaviruses such as uh, MERS, COV2, and um, the SARS coronavirus, these, however, present with high fever, acute respiratory distress, and um, severe respiratory distress syndromes. So what's different? Uh, 
with MERS and with SARS. The transmission prime was limited, and we will see why the transmission was limited uh, between humans, and the containment was very good. With uh, the COV-2, or COVID-2019, uh, the transmission seems to be moving pretty fast with the reproductive number being between, initially it was stated between three, two to three, but now recent figures have, are putting it a little bit higher than that, up to four. So we've heard it in, the virus infects the respiratory tract. Initially, it will infect the upper respiratory tract. It will multiply within the epithelium of the nasal passages and the throat, and it will rapidly, in 20% of the cases, move to the lower respiratory tract. Patients, when they do present with symptoms, will cough, not so much sneezing, not so much of a running nose, high fever. But this diagram is just showing you the distance that the droplets that are generated when we cough can travel. Now, in terms of, as this is a new, uh, newly emerged virus, uh, the exact more um, distance that the virus can travel is not known. But based on other coronaviruses, we can say that safely it would go, it can go up to six feet. But with larger droplets, three feet. I put this here, this actually was taken from the uh, SARS 2003 outbreak, just to demonstrate, although we speak of droplets and we think of droplets just going from you to the three feet or five feet and falling on the ground, it doesn't operate like that all the time. If you have smaller droplets and then some of the moisture within these droplets um, dries out, they can travel further. And then if within a building where the ventilation actually recirculates the air, if the droplets are very small, there's a possibility for the droplets to continue to be recirculated further through the systems. This also applies to closed hallways, okay? Um, we're addressing the community, not just here at the university, but throughout the island office spaces, ventilation, and of significance, bathrooms. Of late, we know that a lot of the bathrooms, particularly in commercial areas, you will have the vent, you don't have a window anymore, but you have the exhaust, you have the ventilator, the air AC coming in and you have the exhaust. So, and then you flush the toilet and very few people cover the toilet when they're flushing it. My children have to walk behind them. They don't cover the seat. You don't cover the seat, you flush it, you're generating the, what, Prof Figaro? Okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called the name, but you're laughing. It's true, right? The children don't do it, right? <laughs> Adults don't. Thank you, Prof Abel. Thank you, right? Well, now maybe more people will close. To tell you the truth, I'm closing my seat more frequently now as well. So, we spoke of the incubation period. It's been said in many of the published um, articles that it ranges between 2 and 14 days. But recent articles have it up to 28 days now. So we'll soon see exactly whether they will have this figure put in. So we have patients that present mild or asymptomatic, and then those who are more severe. This timeline here is showing you how someone who is going to present with a more severe illness is going to present. And you see for the onset of symptoms, say, to a hospital average a seven days for someone who is going to present in a more, as a more severe case, seven days to hospital admission. Um, shortness of breath can come between five and eight days. Then you have the onset of acute respiratory distress syndrome around day 79. And then usually the ICU admission is between day 10 to 11. I mentioned this. And this is actually, this is from another published um, uh, paper that compared uh, the symptoms of SARS-CoV-2, MERS, and, um, and SARS, and showing that sore throat, although it was more prevalent with MERS 
and the 2003 SARS, it's not as prevalent in the present 2019 COV. You can have it, but it's not as severe as it was in the MERS and SARS. But this is not to say that if you don't have a sore throat, that it's not a, a consideration. I'm just saying that in within this particular study of 41 patients. So transmission, we've looked at droplets, how they spread. And this is an example of a current case of transmission that occurred recently from the index case that visited Germany. This gentleman visited Germany, went to China, and got infected. He attended a business meeting there. Now, he infected patient one. Now, if you notice, when he infected patient one here, his symptoms, the, he was symptomatic first at the time when patient one was infected. Patient one got infected and then patient one, who also attended the meeting, infected patient two. Patient two, however, if you look at this, patient two contracted the disease when patient one was actually asymptomatic. Uh, patient two transmitted it to patient three. Patient three, they didn't say whether this patient was a confirmed participant of the meeting, but patient three also contracted this during the asymptomatic phase of patient two, and similarly with patient four, and then you see a longer period where the patient is actually asymptomatic with symptoms developing further down rather than earlier on. This is another case study referring to a cluster of present cases that have occurred. And this is with re reference to some cases in the UK that were a part of a larger cluster of 13 British nationals who tested positives for SARS-CoV in the UK, having sp um, Spain and France when they returned from their the ski resort in France. And we have patient one who not but index case one at the ski resort who infected there were 12 persons there at the ski resort and this just shows you the transmission that occurred among the patients the, the, among i don't want to call them patients before they're patients <laughs> among the other visitors at the ski resort and also them taking it home so in red when they're outlined in red here shows you um the, the transmission that occurred to other persons outside of the ski resort once they had left it. So what am I trying to get across to you here? How easy is it to transmit this virus from one person to another? This did not happen as easily with SARS. It did not happen as easily with MERS. So although SARS and MERS had a higher case fatality rate, their denominator was smaller, so hence the case, case fatality rate would appear to be higher. When we are calculating and reviewing our figures, we need to take into consideration not just the denominator, we need to look at the percent of patients who are actually presenting in the severe spectrum, and also we need to consider in terms of the case fatality rate or the percent of persons who are at very, very high risk, uh, whether they are immunocompromised, etc., and the whole demography of the country. Because with China, their age, the, the distribution of their age is varies to ours here, varies to in the states. So each country needs to look on the distribution of the age of the population when you're taking this into consideration. I put this here, this has many colors. This is also uh, looking at the phylogenetic analysis of over 160 uh, viruses, the genomes from cases, and it's very colorful. And it's actually showing you the variation in the mutations that are occurring with the present COV-19 virus. So as it is being transmitted and as it is replicating, it is undergoing mutations. However, the mutations that it has undergone to date uh, 
have not accumulated significantly or there has not been a major mutation to actually cause a major change in the um, body's response, antibody response. And also remember that mutations can work both ways. You can mutate, something can mutate to become less virulent or, or something can mutate to become more virulent or it can have no impact at all. But I just put this slide here for you to understand that this is a dynamic process that is taking place. So what happens when this virus actually we be exposed, becomes exposed to our mucous membranes, it attaches, it's different, it uses a different receptor to that of SARS-2003, to that of, I mean to MERS, um, to the MERS virus. It uses a similar receptor of the SARS-2003, that's the ACE2 receptor. Now, where in our bodies, this is the renin angiotensin system or angiotensin converting enzyme, okay? Where do we have this in our body? How is it distributed? This is also going to affect, and this is part of the theory, and more papers are being published on it now as to why do we, are we getting this severe uh, reaction, uh, uh, pathogenesis with this virus? Why, when you put the patients on the ventilators, we're not getting the response that you expect? Why? Because you're activating the cytokines, because your whole renin angiotensin system is being put into play, etc. This is all something that is happening and uh, we don't have definitive, we don't we have elucidated the full pathogenesis of, the, of it as yet. But when we talk about hypertensive persons being susceptible, we have to think about that. And new drugs, how are you going to respond to, how are you going to treat? Treating hypertensive patients, you have to take into consideration that this virus actually is using the ACE2 as a functional enzyme to enter the cells. So in looking, how can you, so in looking at treatments or ways to manage it, what they're looking at are um, monoclonal antibodies or soluble 2 is um, inhibitors to see if they can use this to try to block or decrease the entry of the virus into the cell. This is just showing you the MERS here. The DPP4 is the receptor for MERS that enters into the cell. Whereas again here, looking at the replication here, it's the ACE2 for SARS-CoV entry. Once a virus enters into the cell, it has to, because viruses replicate in living cells. Right? So when it comes into the cell, it forms an endosome, and that endosome has to become acidified, okay, so it can actually release the genome into the cell so it can replicate, use the, the, the host reticular endothelial um, in, um, ER to replicate. So changing the pH in the endosome has been shown to decrease. If you make it more Basic, rather than acidic, is shown to decrease the amount of replication of the virus. But as I said, all of this is in, uh, these are trials, and there is nothing definitive in it. But I'm just showing you, because we are a university, we think, we put forward theories, we have a lot of young minds, we have a lot of experienced persons, we have a lot of experts here. So this is where we need to put our minds together and say, okay, this is how the virus is working. What can we do to, what, what do we have available to us already? And what knowledge do we have? How can we intervene in, to decrease the pathogenesis of this virus? Proteolysis is also key to the entry of the virus into the cell. With the, uh, unlike the SARS virus, the SARS virus, that spike protein that you have there, that spike protein is what actually attaches to the ACE2 receptor. But also in SARS, the 2003 SARS, it had to be cleaved to get entry. With this particular uh, 2009 COV, it does not have to be cleaved. However, there's a precursor spike protein, that's precursor that needs to be activated and it's activated via a protease. So this is where the proteases can also come in to consideration in terms of treatment. 
how stable are the coronaviruses in the environment? Prof. Christie had referred to this. Usually for large droplets, 24 hours in a cool area in terms of being in the, in the environment, in the air, but they'll usually settle. Uh, an infected person in terms of the stool, uh, it can survive in the stool for up to four days. In terms of hard surfaces, hard surfaces over 48 hours, as I said, these numbers are not definitive because this is a new pathogen that we're looking at. And in terms of PPE, personal protective wear, people put on personal protective wear and you figure everything is cool, you don't have to do anything else, but guess what? Your actual personal protective wear does get contaminated as well. So when you're putting it on, what you're putting on is clean. But when you're taking it off, you have to make sure that you're taking it off the right way so that those any, so, so that the, 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 the virus or any contaminants that are on it, you don't go and contaminate your clean self now when you're taking it off. So taking it off is very, very important and it can survive for several hours to days on PPE. So PPE, particularly for this particular virus, if we want to mitigate transmission, you don't want to be walking around the place with PPE on. Once you finish doing what you're supposed to be doing, then you take off the PPE. That's why these PPEs are called disposable PPEs. Okay, and you throw them away. No reuse. I put this here. This is Paho's publication, weekly publication for this week. Just showing you the trend for influenza circulation within the region, Latin America and the Caribbean. I put it here to show you the Caribbean is on is this row here, and this is um, at the USA, right? Now, in the other areas of the Latin American and Caribbean, this is the end column here is 2020. But if you look in the Caribbean region here, you see that we're still having quite a bit of, a little bit of activity of influenza occurring. Why am I talking about this? I'm speaking about this because what will still happen until the flu season subsides is that you're going to have circulation of more than one um, viruses. This is another, um, put out by CARFA, the graph, in the PAHO publication for this week, uh, we see both here the circulation of flu and also of um, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, which respiratory syncytial virus will affect mostly the very young and also um, older persons, but it, this is important. and. Young adults and adults can also get him be infected. But I put this here again to show you that it's not just flu, okay? We also have RSV, that is also a possibility. And there are several other viruses to consider uh, also. So in terms of treatment development and preventions, we mentioned in terms of the mechanism of action. So we're looking here now, how do we protect ourselves? Persons should try to get uh, their immunizations against um, their pneumococcal vaccine and also influenza, so that at least if you get ill, at least you rule out, you won't get that sick. You're not going to get co-infections, too many co-infections occurring, right? So I would encourage persons uh, to, to get the flu vaccine and be careful that when you get in it, they will ask you, are you allergic to egg, or have you had any other um, allergic responses before? Because if you are ill, you have to wait until you get better before you take the flu vaccine. Uh, early detection is very important, and Dr. Webster will speak to the surveillance that is set up. In Jamaica, we have very good sentinel sites um, set up throughout the different parishes, and she will speak to the plan as to how that will, will um, take place. But surveillance and, um, is also to be done within your community and at home. This is where people need to start talking to each other. Neighborhoods, group chats, okay? Um, in terms of within your home, within your family, who in there is coming home from school or coming home from work has a fever, has a cough? Who else in your family? So monitor, you have to monitor yourselves. You cannot just rely on one person to get ill and then they 
come rushing to hospital. Everybody needs to be very vigilant at this time. Um, laboratory detection, early detection. Okay, if you find that or persons find that they have a respiratory illness and they are deteriorating, it's not getting any better, then you need to pick up the phone, call somebody, you need to seek medical attention because the whole aim of all of this education, etc., is for us to come become more aware so we can decrease the severity of morbidity that we get and decrease the mortality that is associated. In the pipeline, there are some vaccines in the pipeline in development. Moderna is developing one based on messenger RNA, mRNA. Um, Novavax, one that is going to be using nanoparticles. And um, Inovio Pharmaceuticals, a DNA vaccine. Uh, there's a neutralizing antibody in trials right now. That's Regeneron. And also, you have mo other monoclonal antibodies um, being developed. And we have the nucleus, uh, an additional nucleoside RNA polymerase inhibitor also in development and in trials. But as I said, these are in the pipeline. Test drugs. What are some countries doing? Both China and Thailand actually experimented and they have trials going on now where um, they tried combin combining oseltamivir, which is a flu drug. It doesn't have any effect on coronavirus, but um, they use it in combination with lopinavir and retinavir, which is one of the HIV drugs. And also the interferon alpha is, has been tried, and you also have remdesivir, which is an um, Ebola drug, and it affects the polymerase, and this is also something that is considered. So these were considered in some of the other countries. They found, oh, what I don't have up there, which you rem um, the chloroquine phosphate, the antimalarial, that has been found to have good efficacy so far. But as I said, this is all in trials, and it's not approved for coronavirus, but these are drugs that are there, so everybody is um, trying to see how best. Prevention measures and recommendations. We spoke about work, facility, uh, knowing the seating arrangements, the ventilation system, we mentioned that. In, at churches, for communities to look at how they are going to change their approach when they have gatherings or persons coming in. Prof. Christian mentioned about the uh, outbreak in um, it was South Korea, right, where one person went to church and within four days we heard that 11 people were infected who were around them. And then within 10 days we heard it was 42. And then within 12 days we heard that at one person infected over 80 something patients right so in terms of understanding the transmission washing hands hand sanitizers all of that is important but people need to if you know you're sick stay home or I don't know if Dr. Bruce I don't know how many people you're going to have coming to work <laughs> because we have flu we have RSV we have para influenza so uh, proper PPE, so personal hygiene, covering your mouth, when you're sneezing, using a tissue, dis um, discarding it properly. Um, all of these, using your elbow, Some, it, it's not going to stop when you cough into your um, elbow or, or your, your, with, with your clothes. It's not going to stop everything, but it will minimize, okay, the spread of the droplets. Also, touching the eyes. A uh, couple of the patients in China who presented, some of them presented initially with conjunctivitis, right? There is another one, that recent doctor that died, um, she was 34 years old. She was actually taking care of a patient who came to hospital with a gastroenteritis, right? And they developed a pneumonia as well. So when patients come in, if they do come in with one thing but develop something else, you need to be alert and, 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 and think of the, the, what's, what's going on. We spoke about um, for schools, this um, I think Dr. Uh, Webster will talk about. What I want to note is um, for medical uh, persons or persons using their stethoscopes, their cups, they have to start disinfecting it and not take the same stethoscope from one person to another. Um, in terms of pharmacies, and um, the Ministry of Health and Dr. Bruce can 
think about this. I have, I'm afraid to go to a pharmacy because I've been within the past two weeks just to pick up regular things. And when I go, I sit down waiting and then the person, I have two, three people beside me sneezing and coughing. Nobody covering them. Not, the big signs are there, you know. And then when I'm leaving, I go to buy my bottle of water and I go to the cashier and she goes, achoo. <laughs> right so and i said to her please stop go wash your hands and she looks at me like i'm a dragon you know and i said no well you have hand, and they have the hand sanitizer right there right there so at the pharmacies i mean they need to because people are going to be going to the pharmacy for panadol right okay in offices as well in the community when you go to drink from a water fountain okay do not put your mouth on it, right? And you carry your bottle to refill it at work from the dispenser. It doesn't have to go right up to the top of the thing. You understand? Because you're putting your germs now, contaminating that and passing it onto, onto someone else. Cleaning for disinfecting general environment. Dr. Bruce has spoken to that and we won't go into the details of bleach. Is, is effective. Also, 70% alcohol, okay, is also effective against this virus, which is a good thing. At least you know that 70% alcohol works. Uh, the proper use of PPE, we won't go into the details of that um, today, but we mentioned it. And there are guidelines as to which PPE to use when. And let me just mention this. When you're taking a sample, to send to the laboratory. Remember, this is a respiratory infection. So if you're taking a nasal swab or a throat swab, you have to protect yourself. You have to put on a proper mask because if it's a patient presenting with respiratory symptoms, right? Usually when you try to do a throat, the person is going to cough on you. Anyway, a gag reflex, yes? And for persons particularly in ICU, when they're going to intubate, that's very high risk in terms of doing an intubation and the generation of aerosols. And social distancing. I will close with that. Because we're all supposed to be practicing social distancing. And the recommendation is four to six feet. So I don't know how many of you actually have four to six feet between. Uh, Prof Bain, oh, you're lucky. Right, yeah. This is just, uh, the, this um, PowerPoint will be available showing you the difference with the social distancing. And government officials everywhere, they don't be afraid to wear your mask if you have to wear your mask. Okay, if you're going into somewhere that you know is contaminated or there's a potential, protect yourself because that's the only way that we're going to minimize the spread and the effects of this virus if and when it comes here. Thank you. Okay.